I don't know whether Brett realizes or not in the selection of all those songs or that anybody here recognized it or not, but all of them had to do with Christians persevering. You look back at all of them and there's something in every one of them that it's indicating that we must be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know our labor is not in vain in the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. When I look round about through the years I've preached, working with this one, that one, and the other one in various circumstances and situations, I think it comes to over 58 years now. One of the things that has stood out about people, some people, is, I guess I can say all of us to a certain extent, is the fact we like for people to speak well of us. I know sometimes it can bring cold chills over you when you hear what some people say about different ones. And yet our Lord in vaccinating the people in his earthly ministry warned them about that kind of thing. And in verse 26 of Luke chapter 6, he said, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. It's amazing how sometimes we think we have a strong faith and confidence in God and Christ and the gospel system. And that strong faith must come for a from a proper knowledge of the word and the conviction brought about in us by the same because faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And yet we sometimes realize that our faith is just not really as strong as we thought it was. And many times it comes because people and Satan using them as a way of just pulling the rug right out from under us, just surprising us at what people do, what they don't do, and what they say and how they say it, none of it in harmony with what the Bible says Christians ought to do. And you know you expect that from people who are not Christians or denominational people who really don't know what Christianity is. But from wherever it comes, one way or the other, the Bible teaches plainly that we must persevere. That's something I must do. Now, in our fellowship, one with another, we ought to be mindful each one of us can help each other to persevere. Part of the worship assembly on the first day of the week, when you look at Hebrews 10.25, is that as we engage together in that great fellowship of the worship of God, these become assemblies of exhortation. And that means to help us persevere at other times. I want you to look with me for a moment to Ephesians chapter 6. Chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. Here is where he is talking about, Paul is, that Christians are to put on the whole armor of God. Now, the whole thing is so that they'll be able to withstand the wiles of the devil, to persevere, to remain faithful. But I want us to look at verses 17 and 18 as to that part of the armor of God. He says in verse 17, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now many times in preaching on putting on the whole armor of God, we go over what all is said starting in uh, verse 14. Because in verse 13 he says, 
that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So he tells us what we're to put on to be able to do that. But I don't know how many times we actually notice as it comes to the end of that, that he says, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. I want us to understand that if we get to heaven, it will be because we persevere in doing what God wants us to do. So let's talk about the text here just for a moment. I've already mentioned that he's talking about the whole armor of God and that this armor is available and is for the Christian to put on, to wear. That it's very practical for a soldier of the cross. It was part of what they had and it describes a Roman soldier's armor of that day and time. And this armor is available and is for the Christian, a member of the church, a citizen of the kingdom, a soldier of the cross to wear. And here's the point. Without it, one cannot persevere. That armor that he mentions here is nothing if the Christian doesn't have the right mindset, the right disposition of heart, the right attitude. If you look in verse 18, you'll see that Paul speaks of this attitude or mindset. He first speaks to the Christian's need to engage in prayer. Notice they're coupled together. He also needs to watch, and then he says it with all perseverance. Have you ever asked yourself the question, what does that mean? Well, the word perseverance means to persist or endure in spite of elements arrayed against you. It doesn't mean just keep on keeping on when there's no problem. It means in spite of the problems, knowing the problems will come. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's from a Latin root that really means through severity, through severity. Now, in our day and time, to be faithful to the Lord, perseverance is important. In an age of instant oatmeal and microwave popcorn, all kinds of quick this and quick that, and trying to get something faster and faster done without little effort. We want everything to be delivered to our doorstep. And we want it on time or before we wanted it. <laughs> Convenience is the big thing of the day. And in such a culture and society, how do we develop perseverance? In wearing and learning how to use the armor of God. So I want us to learn and to develop perseverance. When I say I want us, that includes me. I want to be able to persevere. And I'll tell you why. I want to go to heaven. I'm not going if I don't. It's that simple. Someone said, well, before you can persevere, you need to severe. Before you can persevere, you need to severe. Remember, we noted just a moment ago that the word literally meant through severity. When I think for a moment, this can come in the form of tests, various kinds of trials or troubles. I think of some of the songs we just sang and worshiped God. So one cannot persevere without the severe. There's no way around it. If you're going to go to heaven, then you're going to, every one of us will, share in troubles. We'll have our own share of troubles. So it turns out that some of us may have more than others. 
I knew a preacher, I only knew him an acquaintance, who had a terrible disease. And it was one of these nerve disease to where, there, where in time he, he lost most of his control. And yet he did some of the finest writing I've ever, I've ever read in short, brief articles. And he wrote till he couldn't do any more. That was perseverance. Paul told Timothy again, Yea, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3.12. I don't know why that we think we don't simply because we're not being fed to the lines or literally nailed to a cross. Just think of the choices many times you must make on the job and the fallout that comes from them. That's going to happen if you're faithful every day of your life, wherever you are. And uh, I promise you, Satan will see that it will happen. And what are you going to do when it does? Well, the Christian already has in mind, I'm going to do my best under any and all circumstances, situations to be obedient to the Lord. That certainly helps as a starter to have that kind of resolve of mind. You remember Paul, of course, as he faithfully served God, as an apostle of Christ, an evangelist of the Lord, had his great share of troubles. I've never undergone this. I've often thought if the Lord had not given the apostles the miraculous powers of the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit, I don't know how they would have stood up against the things that they did. Of the Jews, Paul says, five times received I forty stripes, say one. Have you ever been hit with a belt about two or three times across your naked legs? Well, imagine then what these fellows are doing when they had to give him 39 stripes. And he says, I underwent that five times. But that wasn't all. He says, three times I was beaten with rods. I don't know how big those rods were, but it didn't take a very big one to sure put a switch to shame, and the switch is pretty bad. He says, once was I stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. And then this, I've often thought about this part. The ocean to some people is a very beautiful thing. It's sort of scary to me. He says, a night and a day I have been in the deep. A night and a day. He doesn't even enumerate the journeys for his service to God. He says in journeys often. He doesn't tell us about what these perils were like, but he says in perils of waters, perils of robbers, perils of mine own countrymen in perils of the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches, 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 28. I don't know how he bore up, but he persevered because when I come to his writing to Timothy, he said, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. Now, the only way he was able to do that was through a deep, abiding faith in God and Christ and the gospel system. One that knew that this world is passing by rather quickly. And whether you want to live like it or not live like it, it's going. But I've often read that, and I've preached sermons like this I don't know how many times, one way or the other. And see, brethren, who we have little to stand between us and assembling with the saints to worship God, 
but ourselves. And yet some brethren just seemingly can't have enough get up and go to go out and start the car and come to worship God. Too many other things are far more important. And of course, not all troubles are external. We can place a tremendous amount of pressure upon ourselves. I've spoken on this a multiplicity of times. It grew out of my own study, as every sermon I preach usually does. But we place a great deal of pressure on ourselves through worry. Setting unrealistic goals for ourselves thinking neg negatively toward our friends. You think about how many times we're just not thankful like we ought to be. And yet it's one of the marks that is not being thankful of the Gentiles as a whole departing from God. They became unthankful. And how many times do we really obey the commandment to rejoice of the Lord? But we ought to. We carry burdens God never wanted us to carry. It may sound like a person is hard of heart and uncaring, has no tenderness about him or her as the case may be. But when people choose to go contrary to the truth of God because something else is more important to them, let me ask you something. Why should I worry about that? Why should I take thought about that which I can do absolutely nothing about? I've been doing all I know to do. You're there to give them encouragement. You preach words of the Bible to exhort them, to reprove them, to admonish them, to encourage them. You're ready to help when you know there's a need of help. If you just knew what to do, you'd try to do it. You try to be ready unto every good work, but I guess it just comes down to this. Some people are just going to go to hell no matter what we do. And I have to accept that. I don't like it. Remember the Lord said one time to the Jews of his day, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Why would he say that to them? He's the Savior. He's the great physician. He said himself, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. The whole aren't in need of a physician. The sick are. That's what I'm doing. And yet, they went ahead and did as they pleased. I have to, if I'm to persevere personally, you too, you have to determine to go ahead and not let those things cause you undue worry. Pray about it. Be ready to help any way you can. And let it go. That's not easy to do. When you really need to let some things go, it's usually when it's the hardest thing to do. But that's exactly what's what. Commit it to God. Review your life. Make sure there's not something in your life you need to change. And then let it go. I cannot for you and you cannot for me live my life in service to God. Every person must bear his or her own burdens. The way we help people bear their burdens is by showing them the truth, being there for them, practicing pure and undefiled religion before God, all of those things. But when you're doing what you ought to do and it's not making any impact as far as you can see on your brethren, I don't intend to worry about it. You say, well, I just can't help Yes, you can I just can't help it. Yes, you can help it. The Lord told you not to, and if he said not to, you don't have to. So why are you? Because you cultivate that. You cultivate that. When we persevere through trials, we will grow as Christians. And we're expected to grow. We're taught to grow. It's part of being faithful to grow in knowledge and practice of the truth and the grace and Love our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter said regarding those who suffered various trials that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, 
might be found unto praise and honor and glory when? At the appearing of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 1, 7. Now, I'm not saying what I've just said, just say ignore people in the church and their weaknesses and whatever. There's too much of the Bible that says you're to be ready to help them. If you see a brother sin, you go and try to deal with them like the Bible says. I understand all of that. I'm talking about when you've done what you can do and you're ready to do what you can do and you're always there. <laughs> it's sort of like a fire department. They're there all the time. Think about it for a minute. But they're not going to do much good if the person whose house is on fire won't call them. Same thing's true when it comes to police and so many other things like that. We have to know when we need to call. We have to know when we need to depend upon other people and when they can't help us. Well, you can't live the Christian life for me. I can't obey the gospel for you. Your parents can't obey the gospel for you. Your brother and sister can't do it. Your children can't do it. Only you must decide if God searches your heart the light of the truth you know that you're going to obey the gospel. And then you must set about to do it. Jesus said, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried... He shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Have you noticed promised to them that love him and the idea of perseverance are all sort of in the same breath? How can you say, I love God with all that I am and all that I have? I love my neighbors myself. I love my brethren. But I just didn't feel like coming to worship today. Well, how are you going to feel tomorrow? <laughs> how did you feel yesterday? Over the years when I preached at country congregations, and I know they're not the only ones that have flower beds and gardens, <laughs> but it wasn't unusual to be driving through the country and see one of the elderly ladies. And I know now they were probably about my age. <laughs> at that time be bending over all afternoon in the flower bed digging up some bulb or moving some plant or working in the garden Sunday morning where are they just didn't feel good this morning wonder why I wonder why if you know that kind of thing is going to put you down and you know where to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, get in the flower bed on another day if you must and rest on Saturday so you can be with the saints to receive spiritual strength as you worship God together. You think many people think that way? I don't think so. I'm sad to say. We can't say that we persevered until a sufficient amount of time has gone by and we've had to make some decisions that are pretty serious. They can put it, get us in trouble, and many times maybe they have because we made our decision based upon the truth of God's Word and how we're to live. Are, are we all familiar because basically our our children have said, uh, are we there yet? <laughs> Seemed like that came rather routinely from our kids as we made trips because we always had several hour drive to get to either one of our parents. Are we there yet? Well, you just hold that because we're not when it comes to heaven. <laughs> Thus, perseverance is still needful. Truth is a very important part of our persevering and serving Christ. It's what gives us the reason to persevere. It's not enough to persevere if we don't have something to hold on to. Now, question. As a Christian, what do you have to hold on to? 
Do you still have more of this world to hold on to? Or do you have Christ and the truth and living it to hold on to? Truth is worth, uh, worth persevering for. In order for our perseverance to have value, we must have truth in our lives. That's the reason it's so important to understand the nature of truth. We've got to persevere in doing the right things. The right things come from the truth. When all else is crumbling around us, then this gives us something to hold on to. Now, some of us haven't lived long enough to have things crumble around us, to experience things that you can't control. Sometimes you have to live life long enough and get old enough and maybe get decrepit enough physically to where you realize, hey, I'm going to the doctor. He's going to give me all these things, and usually there's more than one doctor, but uh, it may make you feel better. But it's not going away because I don't know of a pill yet you can take or an injection that's going to give you youth back. Do you? There comes a time in the faithful Christian's life, and it ought to be all the time, but especially as you get older, to where you look for the resurrection, the happiness and glory that the mortal mind at this time, even though it knows the Bible about heaven, can't understand. And we must abide in Christ's words to know the truth, John 8, 31 and 32. And listen to what's said in Acts 4, verses 21 and 22. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them. Now listen to this and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Now I want to know if we tell one another that. If you're going to endure, do you really believe it's through much tribulation that we're going to get to heaven? I don't think many Americans think that way. A lot of it is because of the laws that have protected us derived from our Constitution. But a whole lot of this world doesn't know that. That is those protections. But it's still true to one extent or the other in seeking first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness that there's going to be some sort of tribulation that comes upon us simply and only because we're practicing Christians. By persever persevering and doing what is right, then we can be assured that our perseverance is empty. You've seen people who have no more hope of heaven than a jaybird, and yet they will persevere on things. I watch some of these sports outfits. I watched a tennis match somewhere yesterday. These people just wore themselves out. One fellow pulled a muscle and called the whole match off and all these things. And you see what Major League Baseball players do and football players, and they just put everything. And, and, you know, they get to be, what is a lineman's average time? Probably 32 or 3 years old that he can play before he beat all the pieces. He'll stay with it. Now, the biggest thing they've got going for them is a big salary. I understand that. But I don't know what good that big salary is if you're beat all to pieces <laughs> by the time you're 40 and you have to spend all of it trying to figure out how you can get out of bed in the morning. But that's the way people do. They do it all the time. But come to the church and take up your cross daily and follow me. Persevere. It's another story. I've already mentioned in the beginning of the sermon, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You don't lose. God is well pleased with such sacrifices that we make to obey the truth. In Hebrews 13, 16, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. And God tells us how to do all that. Knowing and practicing the truth will aid us in persevering and sticking with it and not giving up. Have you ever thought about the Alamo? 
was about 185 men died there. There was a point of no return for those men. They had the chance to leave. Now, what did they think they were going to do against three or 4,000 or however many Mexican soldiers? What did they think they were going to do? And yet they died for the cause of trying to have liberty in Texas. They died. Why can't we as the army of the Lord have that same perseverance for a heavenly eternal home? Time is a necessary component to perseverance. I've already said that, but it still is. You have to live for a while. You don't know some things till you've lived it for a while. I'm persuaded the Bible's written that way that you have to grow up in knowledge of the truth for some things to become clearer as to why the Lord put them the way they are. And so I'm back to this, uh, are we there yet? <laughs> no, we're not there yet. But we're on the way. If we will persevere, we'll get there. Have you ever thought about this? Repetition, doing things over and over again as long as it's the right thing will help us persevere. Repeating the things that are good. Bible study. Study the Bible one day and that's all you study it. Learning better how to study the Bible. Praying to God. Putting into practice by being ready into every good work. The things God says is a good work. All those things are going to help us persevere. The more we experience something, the better we are able to endure it. I've mentioned this at other times concerning the giving of our means. Why did the Holy Spirit have Paul use the Macedonians as an example to the Corinthians along with Christ concerning how they ought to be giving? Why didn't he use some other Christian somewhere else? You want to study the history of Macedonia. It had undergone all sorts of wars and been the seat of civil wars in Rome. They were in a terrible mess economically. It hadn't been that long before that that Caesar even said you don't have to pay taxes to your economics in such a mess. And yet Paul, by inspiration of the Spirit, said to these very rich Corinthians, here's the way you ought to give. And you know why they gave more than I expected them to give? Likely wasn't that much, but it was more than Paul expected them to give. Because they first gave themselves. That's what it takes on everything that has to do with Christianity. We recognize the temporal nature of things that happen in time. And this helps us persevere more. Paul wrote, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things that are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. You cannot see the invisible things if you don't know the Bible. You just can't do it. It is how we see what is there for us that's called heaven. The resurrected body the design and purpose of life in the flesh. Why, you can persevere better in this world by knowing it's all going to pass away. We don't have to endure this. How would you like to endure the way you're living now indefinitely? How would you like to be feeling like you feel right now 100 years from now? And when you reach that 100 years, another 100 years. And you just keep on and on. The world remains the same as it is right now. And it just goes on and on. Well, I don't want to live in that kind of thing. This, this world is, is collapsing all the time. Trouble on every hand. When we know that our days on earth are limited, time can be our friend as we're in the struggle to persevere, to stay faithful. 
Psalm 90, verses 9 and 10 states, For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they are fourscore years, and here's where some of us are, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it's soon cut off and we fly away. Now, if you don't live your life with that realization, then you're not going to live much of a life even while you're here. Time is our friend in developing the art of perseverance when it's used correctly. And then trust. Trust. In order to persevere, we just simply must trust the Lord and trust His Word. It'll get us through all manner of difficulties like nothing else can. It will certainly help us persevere. I'm not going to read it now, but you might want to mark Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. If we trust in God, we trust in His Word, and we trust in His Word, we know our paths are directed by Him. When we trust in the Lord, our future will be secure. I like the idea of a secure future. How secure is your future in this life? I doubt it's very secure. You going to get home this afternoon? What do you got planned to do tomorrow? There's a whole host of people, maybe some of us, who have all sorts of plans for tonight and tomorrow and next week. We won't be there. This world will have ended. Psalm 37, 5 reads, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. One thing I know for a fact, that if my life ends on this earth and I die having persevered, eternity is my home when all is said and done. Eternity is my home in heaven. Psalm 62, 8 says, Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. When we trust in the Lord, then we're going to endure Psalm 125, 1, they that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. And in trusting in the Lord, trusting in his word, knowing it, then we have great strength. The great prophet Isaiah wrote in 26, 4, trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Trusting in the Lord is key in developing, shall we call it, the character trait of perseverance. So, tests and trials, God's truth, time, trust, all of that works together for those that love the truth, study it, and guided by it. To develop perseverance. Things just don't shake people up. Who have these things. Like they do. For those who do not. Some people won't think of their death. Even if they're 90 years old. And they have the sentence of death upon them. In a matter of days. Because they haven't prepared. For what's on across the fence. I might say. They haven't prepared at all. They can't afford to think about it. It scares them to death to think about that. And it ought to. Anybody who is unprepared to meet their maker ought to be shaking, as we say, in their boots. They ought to be as afraid of, as anybody could be. They ought not to be able to sleep tonight till they obey the gospel of Christ or if they have sins as a Christian they've repented of. My prayer, and I want you all to know, I pray it readily for myself, for my family, and for every one of you and everybody I know that's a Christian, or those who haven't obeyed the gospel. Let people unprepared to meet God be made greatly afraid in not being prepared. And may it be so moving to them that they will rise up and do what they know is right with the determination to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding the Lord. 
proper fear of God is wholesome and good. And we need to understand that's part of perseverance also. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we beg of you, we plead with you by the mercies of Christ to obey the gospel and believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in him, and being baptized for the remission of sins. As a child of God, if you sin, then repentance is necessary. Confession of those sins and prayer to God for forgiveness. Now, where do you stand before God? If you died right now, do you have any hope of heaven? Is there no fear of falling into the hands of the living God unprepared to meet your maker? What's going to happen if you do? I read Luke 16, rich man Lazarus. It is said of the rich man that when he died, he was buried. And in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Our Lord said that when his earthly ministry 2,000 years ago. That's where that man still is. And how long, you can't measure things there as you measure them here. How long he had been in there, I don't know. But every day, young people, babies, everybody, innocent, the guilty, they rush headlong into eternity. Completely unprepared for what's there. Now, what is your situation? If you need to obey the gospel, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.